On this channel, we've talked about a lot of Abrams tank variants, but recently I've learned about one that is probably the strangest I've ever seen. When General Dynamics revealed their Abrams X demonstrator, many were confused to find it was a lighter tank, not a heavier one. They were expecting, you know, future threats, you want more armor, you want a bigger gun, but no, they opted for a lighter approach. And as someone that's read far too many old DoD documents and PowerPoints, the latter of which feels like reading an Elder Scroll, this wasn't entirely surprising to me. Because even going as far back as the 90s, the army wanted a lighter MBT. And the Abrams X wasn't GDLS's first approach at making a lightweight Abrams. That actually happened in the late 90s with the Abrams Lightweight Variant Tank, or ALVT. But before we get into that, why would you want a lighter MBT? There are actually a few really good reasons. First, it makes it much easier to transport, whether that be by rail, by plane, or by boat, meaning you can ship it to more places and faster. And for a worldwide military like the US's, that's very important, especially since they want rapid deployability. It also means the tank can access more areas, it can cross more bridges, it won't sink as far into the ground, and third, it means the components won't wear out quite so fast. So from a logistics standpoint, a lighter MBT is great. However, that comes at the cost of armor. They didn't want to entirely replace the regular Abrams with this variant. This was basically like a rapidly deployable light tank version of it. Actually, I guess it'd be more of a medium tank, but many people already confuse medium with MBT, so let's just say light. The goal was to create an M1 that could be reduced to 35 metric tons for transport by C-17, with two M1s fitting in each plane. This, as you can probably guess, would be quite a feat. The design would also be partially modular, meaning that pieces could be taken off and shipped separately to further reduce weight. So obviously these wouldn't be combat ready quite as soon, but it is better than nothing. The M1 was already known for having high survivability and lethality, and they didn't want to reduce that on this design. They decided to achieve this by using advanced composites and titanium. Obviously titanium and composites alone wouldn't be enough to reach the weight goals. The design of the MBT would need a full overhaul. So let's start with the hull first. Hull length was reduced about 29 inches, or around 73 centimeters, with the first set of road wheels also being removed. This made it look a bit stumpier, but I actually quite like the appearance of it. The traditional torsion bar suspension system was also removed, being replaced with a hydropneumatic suspension system. If you don't know what that is, it's basically an external suspension system that uses gas instead of springs or bars. Generally, hydropneumatic suspension systems not only offer great weight savings, but also much better off-road mobility, and sometimes they can be independently adjusted. If you've ever seen a tank kneel or adjust its height, that's a hydropneumatic system. Not all hydropneumatic suspension systems are adjustable though, and it's not known if the one used on the ALVT was. It was probably the same system used on the CATDB program. I also have a video on that, but basically it was a program to make a very beefed up Abrams. And this won't be the last time it's referenced in this video. The suspension system was also modified with titanium components, including the idler and final drive. In fact, Many other components were modified to use titanium, including the blow-up panels, gun mount, hatches, sight covers, side skirts, and engine grills. The whole armor array was also changed. It was modified to be taller, and the composite recipe used titanium. You're probably noticing a theme here. You see, titanium is around as strong as steel, while also being almost half the weight, but it is also much more expensive, so you wouldn't normally use it on an MBT. The ALVT used the TMEPS engine, also from the CATDB program. You might be thinking this is a different power pack, but no, it's actually the same engine and transmission as the regular M1, just mounted transversally also known as sideways, and modified a bit. Compared to the regular power pack, it provided 46 cubic feet of free space, around 15% better fuel efficiency, and a new self-cleaning air filter. On the CATDB program, it made more room for more ammo. On the ALVT though, it provided a bit more space and reduced weight by a tiny amount. By tiny, I mean tiny, like 132 pounds. I mean, hey, when you're trying to make a lightweight tank, every little bit counts, right? Now let's move on to the turret, which, much like the hull, was also drastically redesigned, arguably even more so. The vast majority of the armor was removed. In fact, it was almost entirely removed along all aspects. It only provided Stanak Protection Level 6. If you're wondering what that means, it could stop 30mm APFSDS and AP rounds at 500 meters, with 30 degrees of offset. It also protected against very close 155 artillery bursts. Because of this, all crew members were moved to hull level, so they could be protected by the whole armor array, which was relatively unchanged. The loader was replaced with an autoloader, but he was still retained in the crew, being placed in the hull front with a driver. At first I thought this was just for the sake of maintenance. In the past, the army said they liked the fourth guy so that maintenance is easier on the crew, but it also could be that so the crew can take shifts. Say your gunner hasn't slept in 24 hours and needs a break. 
you could have the relatively fresh low to replace him, so your tank's combat effectiveness doesn't go down quite as much. It's probably a bit of both, but I'm just speculating. Anyway, you guys are probably wondering just how much protection the front hull armor offered. Well, it's not great, but it's also not too terrible. It would protect against most older APFS DS rounds, mostly against the 115mm which the T62 used, and some very, very old 125mm rounds, like probably the earliest. But given even Russia's current ammo situation, that's actually not that bad. I'm not quite sure what Iraq was using, but I think it was a lot of heat. And speaking of heat, when it comes to shaped charge anti-tank systems, the front hull armor could stop most of them. I'm not quite sure just how much I'm allowed to share here, but this should be declassified by this point. Now back to the autoloader. Like many other Abrams autoloaders, this one was also made by McGit, previously known as Western Design. The exact model is the compact Abrams autoloader. It was designed to fit in the bustle of a regular M1, while also retaining the loader. It doesn't take up any usable space, only sitting where the gun recoils. So, as the name says, it was a very compact system. It could fire at 12 rounds per minute, or 1 round every 5 seconds. For an autoloader, that's not too bad. Japanese ones are typically faster, but still. Overall, it was a very good and reliable system. It could hold 34 rounds in the turret bustle. As mentioned earlier, the turret bustle is one of the components that could be removed and shipped separately. The regular M1 also has whole ammo stowage, which contrary to popular belief is protected by a blowout panel, but on the ALVT this was removed. This probably wouldn't have affected much since it wasn't used very often anyway, but 34 rounds isn't a ton of ammo. As far as the gun goes, gun depression and elevation were unaffected, but if the army wanted, the system could be modified for higher elevation, up to 65 degrees. I imagine the turret traverse system wasn't changed, so turret traverse rate was probably the same. I did notice one peculiar detail though. When I was looking at the renders of the turret, the gun looked a bit off. It looked too long to be the regular M256, and it also lacked a very distinct bore evacuator. I thought maybe it was an M256 that had been torn down. I mean, when they do maintenance on it, they do remove the bore evacuator and thermal shroud, but it still looked very off. So I overlaid an M256 on it, and sure enough, it was far too long. I thought maybe it was the XM360, which is also used on the Abrams X because it's much lighter than the regular cannon, but the time frame is wrong and the XM360 isn't bigger than the M256. So if I had to make a guess, I'd say it's the XM291, also from the CATDP program. This gun is a very interesting one. It could be either a 140 or a 120, but in this render it looks too thin to be a 140. It could also be modified to use ETC technology. If you don't know what that is, I also have a video on that, but basically it uses plasma to ignite the propellant. This leads to much more consistent performance, and potentially a slight performance boost. This cannon is an odd choice for weight reduction, as far as I know it's heavier than the M256, but it does provide greater lethality. As far as kinetic energy goes, the M256 maxed out around 15 megajoules. For the XM291, it was around 20 megajoules. One drawing shows the commander's 50 cals retained, but that seems a bit odd to me. It seems like it would be a bit of a pain to use, since the commander's seat is now much lower, but they likely have a solution that isn't mentioned. As far as the fire control system goes, that was unchanged. The sights were also unchanged, and located in their usual positions. Given the time frame, I assume that both sights are using Gen 1 thermals, though SEP was around the corner, so it could be Gen 2, though only for the gunner. To accommodate the loader in the hull and because of the length reduction, the front fuel tanks had their size reduced. To make up for this, two more fuel tanks were added to the rear sponsons. Fuel capacity was reduced slightly, from 505 gallons to 458. In spite of this, operational range actually increased. It went from 289 miles to 300, probably thanks to team ups, the suspension, and general weight reduction. The greatest weight reductions came from getting rid of the turret armor, reducing hull length, changing suspension, and shortening track length. It weighed 46.4 metric tons combat loaded, 41.9 metric tons empty, and 35.6 metric tons at max reducible weight. I'm sure you guys are probably wondering, like I did, while combat loaded, its power to weight ratio was 32.32 horsepower per ton, which is pretty insane. For the sake of comparison, the HST VL 31.78. It was never adopted or prototyped in for a good reason. It sounds like a pretty good concept on paper, it uses an existing platform and components, but it is so heavily modified it might as well be a new vehicle. A new vehicle may seem more expensive on the surface, but the ALVT would need to go through the same processes. Designing, testing, redesigning, retesting, fabrication. By that point, a new vehicle would probably cost the same or less. There is a new tank that has a similar role, the MPF, though it's more oriented towards infantry support. It is very similar to the ALVT, but has a 105, meaning more ammo, a diesel engine meaning probably better range, and at 38 metric tons is a lighter. The ALVT would probably be faster and have more punch, but in that air transportable role it's not very important. 
Anyway, hope you guys found that interesting. Like I said, it's one of the stranger Abrams designs I've seen, and I do think it's pretty neat, but yeah, it wouldn't have been great in production, I don't think. Anyway, if you guys have suggestions for video topics, leave them in the comments, and I'll see you on the next one.